morning, everyone. Thank you for getting up on what is the last day of what I hear has been a great conference. Um, I'm going to share with you today some reflections on a topic that I think is dear to me as a researcher. Um, in particular, I think there's a lot we can do as a community to improve our practices in terms of reproducibility, reusability, robustness. Um, and so this is uh, really drawing from my experience primarily in reinforcement learning, but I think with some um, at least discussion uh, starting points for discussions and reflection for people who are working beyond reinforcement learning. And so as a, as, as a scientist, it's always nice to start with kind of a clear definition of what we're going to talk about. So I uh, drew this um, from colleagues at the National Science Foundation who in 2015 proposed the following. Um, reproducibility is the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study using the same materials that were used by the original investigator. And reproducibility is a minimum necessary condition for a finding to be believable and informative. So that seems like a good core concept for uh, those of us who are engaged in the pursuit of science very broadly. And I should, I should note that this discussion about reproducibility is really going on in research disciplines across the sciences, not only within computer science or machine learning. And so this is sort of a segment, but within this broader discussion. Um, in 2016, the well-known journal Nature um, put out a survey of 1,500 scientists asking them whether there was a reproducibility crisis. And 52% of them said, yes, there's a significant crisis. This is a dark red over here. 35% in pink said, yes, there's a slight crisis. Um, a few of them didn't know. Um, and uh, a few 3% said, no, no, no crisis. No need to worry about this. So clearly some, some concern across uh, the different fields. And then they split it up between uh, different uh, disciplines, this is possibly a little small for you, but at the top we have the chemists, researchers in chemistry, and the question in the second graph was whether you have failed to reproduce an experiment. Has this ever happened to people here? I presume a few of you have had some challenges reproducing papers of some of your colleagues. In the case of the chemists, they're having a really hard time. In dark red, more than 80% of them said they failed at some point to reproduce the experiments of other folks. And over 60% of them failed to reproduce one of their own experiments. Um, so, so we applaud the honesty. Um, um, and yet, uh, that is certainly cause for concern. Um, the biologists and the physical, uh, physics and engineering, um, slightly lower percentages, but still high percentage of failure to produce either someone else's work or your own work. There's not that much of a gap between the red lines and the pink lines over here. Computer scientists, it seems we fall in the other category at the bottom of the graph. Um, and so we don't have quite as uh, specific data. I would say, in a sense, we have fewer excuses than these other disciplines for failure to reproduce the results in that the tools we are working with, computers, are by de definition, you know, really predictable machines. And so if we set up the conditions right, we should at least um, have a higher standard of reproducibility, perhaps than fields that deal with the natural world, which is inherently much more noisy than our machines. Um, I did pull aside 20 colleagues in a smaller meeting um, about eight or nine months ago and asked them the same question, right? Is there a reproducibility crisis in this case in machine learning? Uh, most of these are mid-career to senior uh, fellows in the CIFAR program on learning in brains and machines. 45% of them said there's a slight crisis, 35 a significant crisis, and a couple of folks weren't too sure, didn't seem too worried about it. Um, and so there's some awareness of this issue also within our community. Um, so I, I wanted to ask a, a quick question here for those of you who, were, um, who are up this morning. How many of you presented a paper in a conference or in a workshop this week? Authors, co-authors, I assume a good number. Um, how many of you think that their result would hold up if another person just read the paper and tried to reproduce it? Good, some number of hands. Um, how many of you released all the artifacts, short of like your actual computer, but the data set, the code, the hyperparameter, all the specification, and a nice readme file? Either your hands are getting tired or the numbers are dwindling. Um, and so the, the reason it's nice, useful to think about this is um, 
is for the following reason, right? These are colleagues at Stanford who, 1995, said the following. They said, an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself. It's merely the advertising of the scholarship. So in a sense, I think what we came to do together this week is advertising our science. And I am not going to argue that this is not an important part of the business. I think explaining, communicating, and advertising your science is extremely important. And we should continue to do it, and we should continue to do it in these kinds of scientific settings. But we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that this advertising is the science itself. And it's important to remember that the actual scholarship is the complete software, the development environment, the data set, the set of instructions that you need to reproduce the figures, the plots, and in some cases, the proofs in the case of theoretical results. And without all of that information, we haven't done our full job as a scientist in terms of advancing the state of knowledge and sharing that with our community. And so if we want to engage and sustain this enterprise of science, I think it's important to always keep this in mind um, while you know playing by the games of the, the, the sort of enterprise of science that have been set up. Um, I've been working mostly in uh, reinforcement learning um, and as was pointed out, had some early work published here at UAI about 15 years ago perhaps. Uh, my first paper in reinforcement learning was probably around 1999 or 2000. Um, at that time, they were on the order of about 2,000 papers written a year in reinforcement learning and if you wanted to do your survey of your literature, all you had to worry about is sort of the tail end here at the left side of the graph. Things look a little bit different for those of you um, working in this field, those of us working in this field in 2016, upwards of 13,000 reinforcement learning papers published. Um, and if you need to pick out comparative baselines for your work, you need to sort out not just through the 13,000 papers that were published in 2016, there's also the 12,000 papers published in 2015 and so on as you look a little bit backwards, right? So the onus in terms of empirical evidence is clearly getting more challenging. And when there's not strong support in terms of sharing all of the artifacts to reproduce the work and do fair comparison, it makes it very difficult to do. Um, and so despite this, I think there's been some really impressive results in reinforcement learning. And one of the reasons this curve has been growing steadily and the number of people participating in uh, research and reinforcement learning is growing so, so steadily is really because there's a sense that we are making some important steps in terms of our understanding of the methods and our ability to solve uh, larger and more complex problems. And perhaps the most impressive result of the last few years is the AlphaGo system, system built to play the game of Go in this case, through a mixture of RL methods and deep learning techniques combined together, they actually built a system, this is a team at Google DeepMind, that built a system that could play Go at the level of the best human players. And for several people in the field, you know, there was a sense that that achievement was still several years away. And so this was really sort of a landmark moment in terms of our ability to show convincing results with RL. And I think for those of us who had been working in the field for about 15 years, it was kind of nice to finally stop saying that TD Gammon was the highest achievement of our field and to have another um, impressive result to cite. And so in this case, um, there was actually a lot of information released about this system um, through a paper in Nature. Um, they certainly uh, landed the advertisement very well. There was nice uh, coverage in many of the regular media. Um, and if you look at the Nature paper, actually, and go into the appendix, there's a lot of details about the specifics of the methods and so on. Um, but in a sense, um, it, it still remained very difficult to reproduce this work. And some of this, it's a mix of practical reasons um, and logistics reason, right? And so, you know, uh, the original AlphaGo method was uh, based on using uh, expert games. And so having access to this corpus of expert game to train an initial policy uh, wasn't open to everyone. After that, there was the challenge of um, training the system. This required several weeks of training on several GPUs. Um, in this case, the computational resources to do that are obviously not accessible to everyone. Um, of course, all the logistics of like taking your system to Korea to play five matches against Lee Sudol, that's like a whole other level of complication um, in terms of actually reproducing this. 
And so, and so it remains that some specific projects and achievements uh, may be hard to reproduce even with the code, even with the hyperparameter for logistics reasons. Um, but still having the code, which I take as an analogy to a proof for theoretical results, even if you're not able to retrain it on your own or to go Korea to play games against human experts, actually can reveal a lot of information in terms of what works and doesn't work in the understanding of the science. Um, this problem of um, not having all the information isn't a recent one. Uh, perhaps the most well-known uh, of such cases is uh, Fermat's last theorem. Fermat in 1637 jotted down in the margin of a different paper the following theorem. And um, <laughs> it seems he said that there wasn't enough space to write down the proof. All he had was a little margin there and he would leave that till future work. And I can understand that maybe paper was more expensive back in the 1600s than it is today. But still, that meant that for centuries, mathematicians, dozens if not hundreds of mathematicians, spent their time trying to figure out what was the proof to this particular mathematical riddle. And in 1995, Andrew Weil sort of delivered them from their misery and uh, produced a proof that has since been verified for this uh, particular theorem. Um, and in the course of developing the proof, he actually explored a set of mathematical tools or revealed a set of mathematical tools, techniques, partial results that have then, since then been used to solve many, many other problems. And so in addition to having that proof, there's not all of these other tools that were revealed through that. Um, for those of you who are interested, the now longest standing mathematical conjecture is the Goldbach's conjecture. It's been open for only 257 years. Um, and so there's still some time before it uh, reaches the record time of Fermat's last theorem. Um, is, mathematical conjectures aside, I think really, you know, what, what matters in this case for us is really cases where if we want to be able to verify the results and compare for the building of future work, that we have access to as much as possible all the tools that we need. And for those of us who are producing results, that we take on the responsibility to produce that information in a level of um, quality that is perhaps not there in all of the current scientific literature. And so to sort of tie together the pieces of my talk today, um, I would say that I'm really arguing for um, the production of reusable material, whether it's software, data sets, experimental platform, and that by having more of this reusable material, it will enable us and facilitate the reproduction of scientific results, and that is really essential for the robustness of our findings and the robustness of our understanding of science. And in the case of reusable platforms, going back to reinforcement learning, I think we have quite a few of these reusable platforms um, which have different characteristics. So for those who want to work more on a robotic side, which has some wonderful complexities such as partial observability and noisy sensing, noisy actuators, there's the whole suite of robot soccer competition. Um, for those who prefer not to work with robots, um, for reasons that we can discuss at the coffee break, um, there's actually some simulation platforms that have been uh, widely used particularly the arcade learning environment has some high dimensional observations, a whole suite of Atari games where you can train an RL agent to play one of the players in the game. And I, arguably the availability of this arcade learning environment has really driven up the results in reinforcement learning of the last five years or so. There's the Majoko domain, which is also really useful in this case for studying continuous control tasks widely used. Um, in the literature, and more recently, the ELF platform um, allows the development, in this case, of multi-agent strategy games and multi-agent RL more broadly. And so another more recent resources, resource to open up a space. And the nice thing about these platforms is that they're open source, and for the most case, Majoko is a little bit more complicated, but um, they're quite accessible for researchers to use. Um, and they make the, uh, they, by having similar platforms across several research teams, we can actually make progress more easily. So let's dig into the RL setting a little bit more because I do want to take a closer look at the situation in this case. Um, we have several methods that are in a class called policy gradient methods. And so most of what I'll discuss in the next little while is really focused on this class of methods. And if you don't know policy gradient methods, 
it, it probably doesn't matter all that much for the, for the core message. But I'll just summarize quickly. Um, a policy in this case is the strategy that's used by the AI agent. And using policy gradient methods is that means that that policy is actually parameterized and you're learning the best possible policy by gradient descent methods to select the best policy amongst a class of policies. And so there's different flavors of this policy gradient methods and there's several papers published um, over the last few years and last few months on improvements of these methods. And if we just look quickly, right, there's of papers over 2016, 2017. I went a little bit more in detail just at the recent iClear conference, May 2018. There were seven different papers that talked about policy search methods. In this case, a minimum, that's how I just scanned through the proceeding very quickly. Maybe there were many more. Um, and so it's a very active area of research and, and, and I'm not today going to actually explain the intricacies of all of these methods. Um, I would say many of them are really focused on figuring out how we can reduce the variance of the estimate of um, the, the gradient. And that seems to be one of the key problems in terms of improving the performance of these policy search method. What I'm mostly focusing on is just the fact that many, most of these papers, certainly all of the ones from the iClear batch, use essentially the same policy gradient baselines. So they'll propose a new algorithm and to compare to this algorithm, there's a suite of baselines and everyone kind of agrees what are the common baselines. And so there's a small set that everyone's using, algorithms like TRPO, PPO, DDPG, and more recently, ACTOR, are methods that are standard in these comparisons. And so these are methods that are perhaps a little bit previous and that have become sort of the de facto baseline for all of the new work. Um, most of them have open source code, which makes it quite easy to compare to these methods. And so I'll show you one set of results, um, in this case on one of the Mojoko domains. So Mojoko is these little agents that have several joints and you're controlling them. So in this case, it's the half cheetah domain. And if we get this going, you'll see it's a half cheetah because it's kind of just one side of the cheetah and you have to teach it to run. And so the policy in this case is parameterized by um, control at all of the joints in your cheetah. And so on the left side of the graph, I've plotted results for four different algorithms. These are some of the baseline algorithms that we are showing over here. And I'm not really gonna tell you which algorithm is which, because that's really not um, important, I think, to the message for this morning. Um, but just looking at this graph, if you were reading a paper about this, I presume you would interpret the result in the left graph to show that algorithm red is doing a lot better at this domain than algorithm blue or yellow in this particular case, and even purple, right? And so this is a standard way to look at the results. Now, if I look at slightly different tasks of the Majoko domain, if I look at the hopper environment where you have this kind of one-legged hopping agent or the swimmer environment, all of a sudden um, in the swimmer environment, blue seems to have a much better performance and red is just like all the way down, not learning anything at all. And in hopper, the results are a little bit more mixed, but red is certainly not doing very well and blue and yellow seems to be the best method in these case. And so this results in a sense are, are, are a little bit puzzling to me because um, all of these are Mojoko domains. All of them are very similar kinds of dynamics. They're coming from the same simulator. And in fact, the type of dynamical systems that we're dealing with here are um, r relatively similar. A and yet the results of which algorithm, and all of these are you know, algorithms that are policy search methods. They're not widely different techniques. Policy search methods, all published in the last few years or so, have widely different results um, amongst this. And, and so it raises the question of, you know, what results are being presented, what results are not being presented, um, and what can you conclude when three domains with very similar dynamics, four algorithms with similar properties, have completely different results for this. Um, let's dig in a little bit more because presuming that you are an author of a new method and you want to compare to the baselines um, to save some time, you may not want to re-implement the baseline completely when there is publicly available code for it. And so we went digging for um, publicly available code bases, in this case uh, for the half cheetah task on the TRPO algorithm. And what I'm showing you in the graph here is three different code bases. Again, I'm not gonna tell you which is which, um, but Surprisingly enough, three implementations of TRPO, the blue one seems so much better than the red or the yellow. And so if you go back to this, which is asking a question about different algorithms, 
depending which of these three implementations of TRPO you happen to retrieve uh, from your search engine first, you may get really different results. And if you get that benchmark code working, let's say you started with a yellow one and you have the good fortune that you can actually run it all and you don't need um, missing links and libraries, um, and it shows you a curve like the yellow one and your own algorithm exceeds that curve, you're very satisfied with that result, it's not clear that you have a lot of motivation to go and find a second implementation of TRPO, maybe the red one, or a third implementation of TRPO, the blue one over here. Um, and just to be clear, this is by no means a slight against TRPO. We see exactly the same thing if you look at available, publicly available um, code bases for DDPG. Many of these code bases are not, one of them is produced by the authors, many of them are not. And so I'm, again, not really um, trying to pick on the authors of these particular packages. I'm really trying to point out the variance that we're seeing and the impact this has on our practice of our science and the conclusions we draw when using these methods as a baseline. Um, many of these are combining deep learning techniques to represent the parameterization of the policy. And so one of the things that we've also observed is that the network structure for representing the policy has a large effect in terms of performance on the top graph against our half cheetah environment, in this case using PPO, and three different network structure. Um, on the bottom, we vary the activation function for the units of the neural network that is representing the policy. Again, quite a big difference, perhaps smaller in this particular case. And finally, um, in this case, we're looking at a uh, um, combination of different parameters. So on the top graph, the interaction between the reward scale, there's a sense people often rescale the reward function to be between zero and one. And so the effect between the reward scaling and then the norm that is used in the layers, um, whether there's renormalization or not in the layers of that neural network. And so again, intricate interaction between this hyperparameter selection. It's not so surprising in a sense, um, but, but what is really, I think, um, important to keep in mind is that in many cases, the incentive for a researcher to find the best hyperparameter configuration for baseline methods, not your own of course, but baseline methods isn't the same. And so if we don't do that, um, we may be doing great advertising of our new ideas, but it's not clear that we're doing a favor in terms of advancing science and understanding what are really the techniques that are um, having a good performance. Um, and so on this question of how we should measure performance, let me you know, make a few observations in this question. Um, again, our half cheetah environment, four different algorithms. Um, in all of these, there's kind of a main line and then there's a zone around it. And so what we are presenting in this case is the average return over test trials, so that means in all these cases, I fix the policy, and then I deploy that policy on my agent for some number of trajectories from which I get that performance graph. And so, what do we see? In this case, um, the big factor in terms of the confidence interval is really the number of test trajectories you run, right? And in this case, not just the test trajectory for a particular point, but it's sort of restarting the whole training from scratch. So how many times did we go through training with several um, episodes of training? And so, I don't know what kind of N you have in mind, um, but I can tell you what kind of N are being used in the recent literature. Um, again, top eight papers from uh, recent um, publications in reinforcement learning. Um, not necessary to know who are the authors of each of these work. Um, when the second one, depending on which domain they use from three to nine trials, everyone else is five or less, five trials or less. And, and even more interesting, when my students told me about this, I was a little shocked, I must say. Um, many of them perform like a, a, an N number unknown, and then they'll report the top five or the top two of this N number of known. So think of like you're running all of your experiment, you pick a big bunch of random seeds, and then you're gonna keep like the top two results from all of these random seeds. Um, and and this is not just one paper that is doing this, and so that's why I'm not putting the names there. And, and the, the other challenge this is bringing on is the fact that anyone who then wants to publish a paper, remember, these are the baseline algorithms, these are not the new results. Everyone who now wants to publish a paper to compare to this baseline 
of course, it's going to stick to the same methodology. And in this case, the methodology is giving us results that um, perhaps are not as trustworthy. Let me just emphasize this point a little bit more clearly. This is what happens if you have some baseline to beat. I'll put it as a vertical, as this horizontal line over here. And now if I have 10 trials, this is the case of n equal 10. And this is the case where I pick just the top three results. If you see the graph on the left in a paper, you'll be thinking like, huh, not very conclusive. If you see the graph on the right, definitely great results. Let's go write the paper. And so what happens when you look at the top K results is number one, you have a strong positive bias, and number two, the variance seems much smaller in this particular case. Um, and let's look, finally, one last result. Um, this is a graph that a student of mine produced in this case. Um, we were doing this analysis in some cases, so they would come and show me these graphs, and, and without putting labels, which usually I hate, but in this case it was great fun, without putting labels on this. So he showed me these two methods, and we were discussing this experiment. He said, I ran five trajectories in both of them, and then, then he revealed both of them are the exact same TRP code with the best hyperparameter configuration. And just because, in this case, the random seeds happen to have a particular division, you get results that look convincingly to be statistically significant. So, what are we to do with all of this? Um, there's a reason I care about this. There's a reason I have taken upon myself and I have uh, worked with my students to dig into these issues of generalization um, and um, overfitting and reinforcement learning. And it's the following. We are at a stage, you, we saw the growth in terms of the number of RL papers. Um, and one thing I didn't show is the growth in the number of applications of reinforcement learning. Um, but the number of cases where people are looking to apply these techniques after having seen the impressive results of AlphaGo and others, where people are looking to apply these techniques to solve real world problems is large. There's tremendous potential. I, I'm not going to quit working in reinforcement learning anytime soon. There's tremendous potential, really, to solve important problems. In particular, we do a lot of work on healthcare, trying to improve the treatment design through reinforcement learning techniques. There's people doing fantastic work in intelligent transportation, self-driving cars and others to train the policy of the agent. Um, in terms of energy, resource management, um, management of invasive species and endangered species, again, great application potential. I won't talk about financial systems, but they're also. Um, and yet, if the people who are doing these applications are reading the papers that are using these methods, we are in trouble. We are in trouble in terms of our healthcare AI supported system. We are in trouble in terms of our energy system, our transportation system. And so I feel there's a, a, there's a really important moment when the technology is about to be transferred from simulation environments where we've been happily toiling for 15 years to the real world. It's the bar in terms of rigor, in terms of how we conduct our science, how we report our results, and how transparent we are about these results um, is much higher than when everyone's only going to be using this to play Atari game or even to play a game of Go once in a while. And so let's get back, I think, to our fundamental role as scientists in society, which is a view of science towards understanding and explaining a view of science as a collective institution um, where we aim to really have an increasingly accurate understanding of how the world works and hopefully a positive impact on how the world works. Um, there's several uh, good initiatives on this. I, I'm here a little bit to tell you the worst of the situation and I've been carrying this message over the last few months and some people have interpreted this as meaning that, you know, RL is in like so much trouble, that whole field needs to be thrown out. Um, and that is really not my message today. Um, I hope you leave with a more nuanced interpretation um, and it's really about how do we uh, make sure that every step along the way we keep this view of science in our um, straight in our focus rather than a view that is really focused on advertisement and self-promotion and just writing up the next paper and beating the baselines. And so several efforts have been made to improve this. I'm not going to give you a full view of it, but I'll mention a few. Um, one of them is um, a few months ago, early May, a team of uh, researchers 
um, at uh, Facebook in um, Menlo Park actually took on the challenge of producing an open source version of uh, Go. Um, it received a lot less attention than the original Alpha Go paper and uh, because in a sense they knew it was a solved problem from the beginning. But the objective of this problem wasn't so much um, the ability to show that it could be done. It was about producing a set of tools that allowed reproducibility of this. And so as a result, they produced codes that can be used to train an agent from scratch all the way to expert uh, level playing, as well as pre-trained models. So the parameters of the policy that is completely trained and that can run on a single GPU. Um, and so, of course, if you want to train the model from scratch, you're going to need a lot more than a single GPU. In this case, they used 2,000 GPUs over two weeks. Um, and the reason I think this, this group took it on is because um, there's not a lot of groups in the world that had the resources to do that. Most academic research labs don't have the resources to do that. Um, but now both the, the code as well as the fully trained model are available. Um, and that system has become the basis for many of the online uh, Go players since then. This is integrated in the ELF platform. And so people who want to take components of the core code base to solve, remember Fermat's last theorem, right? In the way to solving the theorem, they actually produce some useful insights of mathematical science. In this case, even though you may not be building a system to play Go and you may have other applications in mind, you can actually take modules of the code through this open source ELF platform, use it to solve whatever problem of interest. Um, and because um, they have good resources, they were able to take the bot uh, to Korea, in this case, to play five top 30 uh, Go players in over a set of 14 games, um, beat all of them. In this case, the Go player was playing on a single GPU. So again, anyone with a GPU in their house or in their lab can actually run the train model, and we have the weights for that that are downloadable on GitHub if anyone wants to try. And there's also a really strong record against the, the best of the online bots that are available, 200 to 0 to for Lila 0. Um, and now um, the, this group isn't really investing anymore, but the online Go community has kind of taken it on and now is building um, improved version of this using all sorts of innovative ideas. And so, you know, though you may not um, be inclined to uh, work in reinforcement learning or in Go, I think there's still a lot that you can do if your interests are elsewhere in AI or machine learning in terms of helping this effort towards reproducibility, reusability, robustness. Um, another uh, project that was uh, dear to my heart in the last year is the iClear 2018 Reproducibility Challenge. And this is one case where uh, some of you might have gotten involved last year and may want to get involved next year. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the iClear conference, about three or four years old, International Conference on Learning Representations, and it's essentially um, covering a lot of the work on deep learning. And it's been growing steadily last year. I believe they had about 2,000 attendees and a few hundred papers presented. Um, they have a reasonably uh, innovative model of publication. They were one of the first to use Open Review, but not the last. I think many of the, the last couple of editions of UAI also used Open Review. And in this case, what that means is that the papers are av publicly available for anyone to view and to comment on, um, which is a very nice uh, property in terms of citizen science. Um, in, in many cases, the, the, the quality of the external comment varies a lot, and some of them are sort of very, very short comment, but at least it gives the opportunity for people. And there's been some cases where the public discussion on a paper was actually very meaty and long and very useful to understanding the paper. I know in many cases, um, my students love the, the more detailed discussion as well as in some cases the public reviews because it gives them a lot more context on the paper than just the paper itself. And so, very interesting platform. What we did in 2018 is we actually put out a call um, for people who, during the review period, wanted to participate and try to re-implement papers submitted to iClear. So people could pick a paper, go on their own, from what was available in the paper, try to reproduce as many or just a few of the results in the paper. And the result of that, they would write up um, and they could post as a comment on the open review system, at which point, you know, this was during the review process, and so the reviewers and area chairs were welcome to take that comment into account or not, as they wish. These were not official reviews. Uh, these were sort of participatory contributions. Um, and I used this challenge as a final course project 
in my graduate machine learning course. I had 150 students and I needed a final project. Um, and this seemed like a great experience, both uh, for the students as well as a contribution to uh, science. And so uh, the students just split up in teams of three. So we had about 50 different teams. Um, and because there were several hundred submissions at iClear, I actually put out a call to graduate course instructors across the world. So I had participation from 10 different other course instructors, anywhere um, from um, University of Michigan to Princeton, UC Irvine, people in Poland and people in Tel Aviv responded and participated. And so overall, we had 124 teams or individuals. Um, 95 papers were the subject of reproducibility studies. And everyone was invited to publish what they had done, their methods, as well as like a link to their GitHub repo so that the authors could have access to this. They were allowed to communicate with the authors through the open review system. In some cases, the authors had released anonymous code. In other cases, um, the students asked for the code and the authors sent it to them after the fact. Um, and so we had a good, good level of exchange. Um, and because of the timing in this case, the timing aligned well with the review process. Course projects were due mid-December. A few of the courses, the schedule in Europe in particular schedule was a bit further. They still made their comments available in early January. Um, and after all of this was over and the paper decisions had been made, um, I sent out a survey to the participant, people who reproduced work, people who, um, whose own papers were the subject of the reproducibility studies, people who were um, on the iClear program committee. And I asked them, um, I started by the, the basic question, right? Is there a reproducibility crisis in machine learning? And again, significant, slight crisis, percentages varied a little bit. And then I asked them if their opinion had changed after the fact. Uh, so about half of them, they didn't change their opinion too much. 30% um, or so were more convinced that there's a crisis after this. Maybe they were just a little bit more sensitive to the issue. Um, and then I asked them a lots of other questions. I'll just give you the highlights today. Um, one of the questions was, uh, do you feel you were successful in reproduce at least some of the work in the paper? And so 55% were able to reproduce some of the work, 33% um, were able to reproduce most of the work, and then there's a small percentage that couldn't reproduce most or any of the work. Um, so relatively small percentage. Was it difficult? Right? You want a good challenging final course project for a grad course in machine learning. Um, it was either reasonably difficult, mild difficult, very difficult, depending on the responses. I must say we didn't, um, we didn't do a lot of pre-filtering in terms of the match between who was going to reproduce what paper. We basically told them to explore open review and pick a paper. Um, we did give them a curated set, so the TAs who were working with me went through all of the submissions and came out with a set of uh, about 40 papers or so that they thought were good candidates. And we suggested those to the students, but it was completely up to them to take those suggestions or not. And we also did not constrain that each team was reproducing a distinct paper. So some papers were reproduced up to four times. I think there was one paper that got up to four teams working on it. Um, most of them, it was just a single team. And of course, we didn't cover all those submissions. There were several hundred submissions, I clear. And we only covered 124 of them. Um, out of this came a very thorough discussion on what are the factors and the metrics that are useful for reproducibility? What did people need to get there? Um, of course, there was the basic, right? The availability of the data set, the simulation environments. That was pretty important. Um, in many cases, having the specific partitioning information between train, validate, and test set um, was really important. And we have that for the standard data set, right? If you're working with ImageNet, if you're working with MNIST, this is uh, their standard settings for this. But for many cases, it's not always obvious. Um, having the implementation of executable files, the dependencies, an account of all the hyperparameters, that was also really important. Um, specification of the random seed in some cases. An alignment between the papers and the code. We sort of know this anecdotally, but many of them noted that paper said one thing, code ran something else. Um, where did the graphs land? It depended a little bit on a case by case. Uh, the clarity of the code and the paper were really important. And in some cases, right, the re-implementation effort was quite significant, which put the bar a little bit higher. Um, and for some cases, um, it, when there was code, when the code ran right away, we still wanted the final project to be substantial. So I encouraged them to go beyond just the plots and the tables in the paper 
and to really look at could you reproduce the claims in the paper. So if you're making a statement about a property of an algorithm, and so that may open up the door to trying the same kinds of experiment, but on other data sets that were included in the paper to verify whether the claims more broadly were supported as opposed to just the specific numbers that were shown. Um, going back to the survey, I also asked them, did you have enough computation resources to reproduce the paper? Um, and we had a great partnership in this case with uh, Google Cloud. Um, and so we received free credits that were open to all of the teams that needed to use them. And so uh, as a result, most of them said, yes, I had enough or almost enough computational resources. 24% said not really. Um, and so still didn't meet all of their needs, but we got there for many of the papers. So many people think, oh, it's not going to be easy to do for students on an academic architecture. Turns out it is possible. And then we asked them, how many hours of computation did you use? And in some cases, right, there's about 32% of people who use between 50 to 200 hours. So reasonably significant. And this, this is just computation time, not the work that they put in. So reasonably significant in terms of experimental budget in this case. Um, 23 respondents communicate with the authors and um, through open review. And then another 19 communicated through email, chat, and other means. I think in some cases, the people found the same paper posted on archive, they knew who the authors were. Because they weren't official reviewers, they communicated directly with them, in this case, to obtain code and so on. And so some of them were able to maintain anonymity, um, but not all in this particular case. And finally, uh, we asked the participants, Did you, do you trust the conclusions of your reproducibility work as you communicated them to the authors? Do you feel like you have something that you can back, that you're saying in this case? Um, and a good number of them were highly confident and moderately confident, and a, a few of them were much, much less confident. And of course, this is like a self-assessment, so we asked the authors, right? Do you um, trust the validity of the reproducibility report of your paper, the information you got through this commenting system? And actually, 60%, 59% of the authors said yes. A few were not sure, said no. Um, and to me, this was actually a reasonably a higher number than I would have guessed. When I, when I launched this challenge, I, I must say I had um, a lot of people who were um, not very supportive of doing this and found lots of reasons why we shouldn't do it. And one of the reasons that was often stated was, well, you're asking these folks who don't know a lot about machine learning to evaluate our all-important science, and of course they're going to screw it all up and they're going to say this to the review system and then the reviewers and area chairs are going to you know, throw out our work because, of course, they don't have the good judgment to know that the open review comments are not sound. Um, and, and so this sort of comforted me with the idea that actually a lot of the authors thought that the work was um, of reasonable quality. Not all. There's some question marks in there, but not all, but still. Um, and then uh, we asked the authors how many of them plan to update their submission based on feedback from the challenge. 60% of them said yes. So in a sense, there's, I think one of the take-home conclusions for me, maybe for some of the authors, and we saw that come out of their um, free-form comments also, is really that this, this effort, there's a way to, to do this kind of reproducibility effort in a way that is not all adversarial. There's a bit of an adversarial component to this, but in fact, a lot of what came out isn't so much the adversarial aspect. It's also the fact that for free, you're getting a bunch of people to test out your experiments, and to tell you about it. And so that was really quite valuable, I think, for many authors. Um, we asked everyone about what's the most effective mechanism to encourage people to do this. Again, whether we should do this through courses or some other ways. Um, there was good support for doing it through course project. It seems like the incentives are kind of aligned. Um, and there was also a strong support for putting out an open call for participation and giving prizes and certificates and things like that. Um, and so this may be something that we explore as we prepare for the 2019 version of the challenge. Um, and then we asked the authors, small number, but still we asked them, these are authors whose work was subject to the survey, if you had the ability to select whether or not you wanted your paper included in a similar reproducibility challenge next year, and 79% actually said yes. Um, and so we are going to do it again. If you are planning on a teaching a course in machine learning this fall, um, contact me. If you have spare cycles um, and want to participate as a free participant, um, there'll be a form to indicate your participation. 
Um, and I think, you know, we had good detailed feedback also about in particular that the comments on the reproducibility challenge were very useful and it really helped to um, share code, in some case encouraging the authors to share code, um, and the feedback was appreciated. There's some less positive comments that I also put at the bottom for a balanced view. Some people thought the quality of the reproducibility subject of the reproducibility report was very high variance, um, that in some cases there were non-rigorous attempts that confused the reviewers and distracted the authors. Um, and then um, people wanted to have a reproducibility check on the reproducibility efforts. Um, and so um, that is, you know, something that uh, can be discussed further. Um, just a few final thoughts, right? I think that uh, one I hope message from today is that um, though I fully realize the extra cost that is required to each of us when we commit to sharing the uh, artifacts of our research, I understand there's a cost in terms of time in engineering, um, but if we focus on our mission, which is to improve the state of knowledge and understanding, I think that cost is well justified. Um, I think we also need to develop a culture of good experimental practice. We have a lot to learn from some of the other sciences in this respect. Um, and for those of us who have the privilege to work with uh, graduate students and trainees, to instill those good practices in their own. Um, and finally, I would encourage you all to contribute to the reproducibility effort once in a while, as we do in reviewing, to contribute in terms of reproducing work and finding the right uh, forums and mediums to share the result of that with others. Um, I am here to uh, represent these ideas, but I've had some fantastic collaborators on uh, a lot of this. In particular, the team at the Reasoning and Learning Lab at McGill, the Elf Open Go team, uh, for the iClear Reproducibility Challenge, I was assisted by Geneviève, Rosemary, Hugo, and the RL Reproducibility Study um, was uh, mainly the work of Peter Henderson, Riyashat Islam, um, who did some phenomenal detective work in there. Thank you very much.